to Drupal 8 Migrations by Example. Uh, my name is Mauricio Dinarte. You can find me as Dinarco on pretty much everywhere in the internet. My email and my Drupal.org profile. I am from Nicaragua, beautiful country, and surely warmer than here. So if in the winter you need to escape, Nicaragua is a very good place. Uh. I'm Ben Nelson, Mauricio Odegaric, and I am from uh, Boston in the United States, but we'll be moving to Minneapolis, so it is fantastic to be at this camp. So, uh, going to talk about migration. Welcome. <laughs> I will speak from here for my present show speaking notes. Um, we're going to be talking about migration, and I was interested in what all of you were here for. Um, as in, do you have a specific site that you're looking to migrate? Um, and just, you know, just popcorn style, if someone has something particularly in mind, um, you know, what, what, your, what your migration need is. No one needs to migrate anything? Well, eventually, I, and I was talking to you about this before, uh, we have a policy site uh, at the University of Minnesota, it's the, our policies, and we need to keep track of the current and then the previous revisions. Mm -hmm. In the back? Uh, All right. So you're looking well ahead. Or is the, is the site causing you pain? No. No. So for the tape, that's an exciting reason uh, to want to migrate to Drupal 8 on a Drupal 7 site, which is going to be supported for forever. Um, but there's already new things going to Drupal 8 um, that are not going to Drupal 7. Um, so uh, frequently, people have uh, more drastic needs. Ah, this is the thing I'm holding. Okay. Um, as in, they're on Drupal 6, and that's not been supported for several months now. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's that's frequently uh, what's driving people. Oh, I really need to do this. So I mean, practically, you know, Drupal six is probably good for another year until the PHP it's running on is no longer supported, and then, yeah, that's that's going to be a, a real issue. Um, or you are on another uh, type of site entirely. Um, other not, it's not Drupal that is causing you pain. Um, I searched for Joomla and SAD and got this slide from someone's Joomla presentation. Um, so I, anyhow, uh, Joomla is still active, still good, but um, you know, any, any older site is likely to not be keeping up with what you want to do and give you a lot of reasons to want to uh, move on. Um, so. Your migration from Drupal 6 to Drupal 7 is going to be um, like, you know, maybe building, operating a train. Um, your migration from anything else is going to be building the tracks for the, the train to run on. Um, it's much harder, the Drupal 6 to Drupal 7 um, migration is, is the official upgrade path to Drupal 8. And so the Drupal community has put a ton of work into supporting it. Um, and you know, migrating from anything else will be much harder, and naturally, uh, that's what Mauricio will cover today. Uh, and just uh, background on the uh, the concepts behind migration: it's actually uh, extract, transform, and load. Um, universally abbreviated as ETL. And this is a very, very established approach to. Um, handling data for data warehousing for you know getting it from one form to another and you will see experience with ETL in technical job descriptions all over the place so if nothing else know that if you do a migration you should answer yes to the question um, do you have experience with ETL in a job interview especially um, women in the audience this is what men do yes you have a little bit of tiny you've heard of something you say have experience with it um, and this is this has been like a lot of the you know, studies by Harvard Business Review and stuff that are like wow yeah men just claim they have experience when they don't and women are actually honest about their experience and that's hurting women in 
in job searches. So you have experience with ATL after this session. Um, uh, and naturally, because we're in Drupal, we don't use any of the same words that the rest of the world does. Um, but um, we'll go over how each concept in the migrate module maps uh, to extract, transform, and load. Thank you. Uh, for me, uh, sometimes it is difficult to un understand all these buzzwords, so I try to, even for myself, uh, find the simplest scenario or example that I can imagine. And um, for this ETL concept, uh, this is what I came, uh, came up. Imagine that we need to produce bread. We need to, you know, we, we have a bakery and we need to produce bread, uh, bread. So we need to extract some sources. We need some raw materials. And that is what extracts those. And in Drupal, the extract part of the, of the, of the system is called, called a source plugin. So that will be the wheat and any other you know, raw material that I, that I will require. Once I have all those raw materials, I need to process them. So the transform part in Drupal is called process plugins. And that involves you know, adding yeast and uh, you know, putting them in the oven and so on. So I am do, doing some transformation on the raw material, sometimes combining them together, sometimes taking part of, a, of one and separating part of the other. Any transformation that I need to do, it's done in the process plugins. And finally, uh, when I have the, you know, the, the bread already baked, I, I load it into, let's say, shelves in these cases. Uh, but in Drupal, that would be having the content already in the site, either by consumption, like you know, presenting the information to the user, or maybe uh, to, to, to expose that information to some other system. But uh, what in ETL would be the load part, in Drupal is called the destination plugin. And by the way, if you have any questions, just raise your, raise your hand, you can interrupt anytime. Uh, so this was, this was me like a year ago when I had to do my first migration. I said, okay, I have been working with Drupal for about six years already. This is going to be easy. And then, I, you know, this is just some of the buzzwords that I found out when I started, you know, looking how to solve this problem. And I, you know, honestly, I just wanted to cry. Uh, I just wanted to move some content to my website. Why does, why does it have to be so difficult? And the truth is that in the same way that Drupal it can be arguably difficult to learn, uh, it's because it is super flexible and super uh, powerful. And this is the same case for migration. The migration API can do lots of things. And as we're going to see today, without even writing a single line of PHP code, we will be able to, to do a lot of stuff. So this flexibility comes with a price. Uh, and the price you know, is probably some complexity. But when I understood the concepts of ETL, when I understood what, uh, how this maps to Drupal in the sense of sources, process, and destination, I was able to group together these elements and then combine them as needed. And the things that I didn't need, I just like this post. Uh, in the example that we're going to cover today, we're going to be migrating data from a CSV file, but Drupal supports many sources. Some of those are SQL databases, which is supported by Drupal Core. Uh, and this includes uh, like any SQL database, but also Drupal 6 and Drupal 7 migrations. Uh, as a, with the example that we're going to see, CSV files, Using contributed modules that we're going to show later, uh, we can also get information from XML and JSON files. And there is one module that even allows you to pull information from a Google Sheet. So if you have some you know, information in Google Sheets, you can pull directly that information and put it into Drupal. Then you, you, know, you, you get the raw materials, and then you do to need to do some massaging, you know, some processing on them. And we're going to use several process plugins uh, to illustrate how this works. And in the end, you need some place to store this information that has been processed already. In our, or in our example today, we're going to do that in a node, but migration uh, allows you to also store the information as users, images, files, paragraph. And we're going to cover uh, image and a little bit of paragraph today, too. So. Let's imagine this. 
uh, we have a simple CSV file with information about uh, professors in a university. We, the source, uh, in, it's a CSV file that has the first name separated from the last name and then the department where they belong. So that is the source. In the end, we don't, we don't need in our Drupal site uh, to have the first name and last name separate. We just want the name and we want to put them together. So we are looking to have you know, the destination, like name, both together and the department. So in the process, we need to do something. And in this case, you know, we're using glue to put the first name and last name together. And we're going to do a live demo. And you know, what can go wrong when you do live demo? So if anything doesn't work, please be bear with us. Okay. So we have a Drupal site. Um, Again, he's jumping to the harder migration. It's, it is easier to go from Drupal 6 or Drupal 7 to Drupal 8, but if you need to massage the data, it, all migrations in Drupal follow the same, uh, you know, the same three pieces, and so these tips will still be useful. Yeah? Are you saying that we have to go from 6 to 7 and 7 to 8, or we can go directly no, to no, no, no. 8? Six to eight is actually better supported than seven to eight. Okay. And, okay. and for the recording, the question was if you had, if you will have a Drupal six site, do you need to do to go to seven for going to eight? I know you can go from six to eight directly. So this is the end result that we we're going to work today, um, and we, I I will show you the source files, the CSV files, and then how to do the migration one step at a time. So if I refresh this, it should be gone because I before the presentation I remove it. So let's start. Um, we have a CSV file for professors. So the CSV file contains uh, a, he a he header column and then the rows that are, is the information that we're going to migrate. Uh, we have some identifier for the professors. And then remember that in the source file, we have the first name and the last name separated. So that's why we see, for example, Stefan Freudenberg. Does control plus zoom in? Uh, then we have the biography, and at the end of the file, we have the department where they belong. So that's what we're going to, to do. So in the recommended way to do migrations is to use an example that already exists, and the migrate model provides several examples. So you are rarely going to start from scratch. You, you can you know, copy something and then modify as needed. So I'm going to start with a, with a ba very basic template that I prepared before, the, before the, the session. So this is the bare minimum that we need if we want to do a migration from a CSV file into a node. So what do we have here? In line number one, we, we have the identifier of the migration. Each migration is to, ha to be, have a unique identifier, and that's how it's going to be uh, separated from one another internally. You, need, you define a label, which is you know human readable uh, name, and then you define a source. In this case, the source using the plugin CSV. This plugin is provided by a module called Migrate, CS, Migrate Source CSV. So if you, want, if you want to do something like this, you need to have that module enabled. Then you define the path where the CSV file lives. In this case, it is relative to the, the folder where the configuration is stored. And then if remember that our CSV file has a header for the columns, uh, then we say header row one. If there were none, we say header row zero. And then we need to define an identifier. Which of the columns in the CSV file is going to be my identifier? Like that is going to make this row unique. In this case, it is called professor ID. Usually, um, 
you work lower cases and without spaces for for header uh, in a CSV file and in many other scenarios. But to make it clear uh, for this presentation, every time that you see quotes and some you know spaces and capital letter, that means that that column comes from the CSV file. It is not required, but it, it is going to make you know explaining uh, easier. So that is the source. At the end, in line 14 and 15, we define the destination. So the destination, we say that we're going to use the plugin entity node. Entity node, what it does is stored in a content type. Uh, that is provided by Drupal core out of the box. And we need, you know, we are missing the middle part, the process. So in here, we do two things. One, we define the type. The type is the content type that we're going to use. So the content type in this case, it's going to be the same for all the nodes that we migrate using this CSV file. So uh, we define a default value in line number 11, and we provide what is going to be the default value. In this case, MBE underscore professor. That is the machine name of the content type that I'm going to use to store the nodes. And then um, once I define the content type, then I, all the nodes need to have a title. So in this case, I define title, and then what you have on the left in blue, that is how the field is named internally in, inside Drupal. So in this case, uh, the content type has a field internally called type, and another field internally called title. And then on the right, this is the column that comes from the CSV file. So in the CSV file, we have a, a column called first name, and we're going to put whatever information is there into the title. Um, so that that's like the very basic that I need. And how do you run the migrations? You can run migration through the UI, uh, but for many reasons, it is uh, better to work using the command line, using Drush. So I'm going to explain the process using Drush. And to be honest, it's like two or three commands, and that's all that we're going to need today. So can you set up this mapping in the UI in the as well? So the question is, if you can set up the mapping in the UI? As, as far as I know, you cannot. Okay. You, can, you can run migrations from the UI, but you cannot do this mapping through the UI. So. Uh, so using Drush, there is a, uh, a command ms that will list all the migrations that you have available in your system. In migrate status. Migrate status. So in, in our case, the migration, remember that the ID that we define, this is what we see here, MBE professors, that is the migration. So if I do a Drush mi, which stands for migrate import, and I, I put a machine name, it's done. It already says I migrated three, uh, three items. And if I go to the website, and if I go to the website and refresh, you can see that I already started to get some information. So that's the bare minimum that you need. But we said that for the name, we want to concatenate both the first name and the last name. So how do I do that? I need to do some transformation. And remember that the transformation in Drupal, uh, Drupal Migrate, are done using uh, process, plugin, process plugins. So if I go to that documentation, and this is the only, this is the only one that I'm going to show today, uh, the, the other examples I'm just going to copy and paste from an already configured uh, file, it says that you can use a plugin called CONCAT, which stands for concatenation, and then you define what are the things that you want to, you know, to concatenate. Important things to note is that this is documented in all of the process plugins that are already provided um, by the Migrate module are listed, um, and also that you can write your own, that you can find the code for one of these and start tweaking it to process things however you want. Okay, so going, going back to the editor, 
what I'm going to do, remember that uh, when in the process section, on the left, I have the fill inside Drupal, and on the right, I have the source in the CSV file. But in this case, I am going to do some processing. So I remove that and paste this. One very, very important thing is that this is using YAML. And YAML is very strict with the spaces. So if you have, like for example, if you were to have something like this, it will not work. If you were to have something like this, like you have two, like four spaces instead of two, it will not work. So if for some reason, um, something that it is very clear that should be working, it is not, just check your white spaces. I, it has happened to me many times. Like when you copy paste, um, that's w actually one good way to do migrations in Drupal 8. Uh, sometimes the editor doesn't do the formatting well, and then you know things like that happen. No so, tabs. excuse me. No tabs. Yep. Spaces. Yeah. Th these are these are spaces. Uh, in this case, uh, I'm using PHP Storm, and that transforms the tabs to, to spaces. But if you are using anything else that you have to manually enter the correct white space character, make sure to use two spaces. So, okay, the title is going to be populated with the concatenation of two things. What are those two things? Are the first name. Remember, these are columns in my CSV file, and my last name. One thing to note is that I am doing this using YAML files. Drupal code out, out of the box doesn't support this, for, this form to write migrations. This is provided by a module called Migrate Plus. Plus. So we also have that module enabled here. And in the slide deck at the end, we show all the modules that we're using in this example. So basically what I am saying, concatenate the first name and the last name, and use that as the title of the node. So I go back to my command line, and I have to do something. Because I was modifying a configuration file, I need to import the new configuration. So using Drush, we can have Drush CMI minus Y, which means configuration import, like get the latest things from the file that I just ed edited. And the menu, minus Y is like, if you ask me something, respond yourself yes. So doing that. I can run the migrate status again, and I see that I already have the professors migrated. So what I have to do is revert the migration. So I can run the migration again with the new configuration. So in this case, MR, which stands for migrate revert, and the name of the migration, it says roll back. If I go to the website and I refresh, I see that they are gone. And if I do a Drush MI again, which migrate import, it says three elements were created. And just a really quick tip, you can, if you have a CSV that has 10,000 items in it, migrate can handle that, but it's really annoying to wait for it to process 10,000 items while you're just trying to get your migration working. So if you do dash dash limit five, you know, it'll run as quickly as this, and you can just keep doing it until you get it right, and once you get it right, then you run the whole thing. Um, and I don't know if that's documented as well as it should be. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we now have the name and the last name concatenated, but there is a problem. They are, you know, too close to each other. We want to at least have a space in between. So if I, if I go back to the documentation, and the migrate documentation is really good in Drupal.org, you will see that you can define an extra element to use as a, as a delimiter, which means that uh, between every element that is going to be concatenated, you will use this character. So I select the delimiter. Again, I copy paste in as every good programmer. I put it in the right place. Remember that indentation is very important, that this is a child of title. Like everything that I'm doing here is a child of title. And I don't want a slash, I want Oops, sorry. I want a space. So again, Drush, oh, sorry, Drush migrate revert, the name of the migration, Drush migrate import, the name of the migration. Oh, this is common. If I refresh, <laughs> if I refresh, what happens? 
it, it doesn't happen. And why? Because they didn't import the new configuration. And one thing to note, when working with migration like this, and you need to import configuration, sometimes you also, like in the process, are making modifications to the website. Maybe you added a field or you changed the configuration of a field. Remember that you will be importing and exporting, and that pro process is wipe out everything. So if you happen to make a modification to the website, then you make a modification to the YAML file that defines the migration, and you import that, then the new configuration for the migration will be imported, but your changes to the to the website are going to be lost. So you need to be very careful to, in, in like the order of operations. You first make your changes, export them, and then you make the changes to the migration and import them. You need to keep that in mind. And you know, I just like forgot about that in this case. So as usual, Git is your friend, uh, version control. So just you know, it doesn't matter if you tested or not yet. Git commit any changes you make to your YAML file, then it's always safe to export everything and then just check out the one file that you care about and then import everything. And, and now it works. We have the last name and first name with a space in the middle. Uh, now I'm going to show an example uh, for biographies. So that each, each professor will have a biography, some, some text, and then that text includes HTML content. So how do we import that? We have a field that is like a text long formatted field to store this information. So um, I, I won't be typing as by hand anymore. I will just copy from the example that I already have. And so, the field name in this case is named uh, field MBE biography. That is the machine name of the field that is going to store the biography information. So I need to do two things. One is that I need to define the value. I need, I need to define the format. Remember that this, this is a, a rich text field. So you can have basic HTML, full HTML, plain text, and so on. So I need to define for this field two different things. The value, which is going to be uh, you know, whatever that it is in the CSV file. There is a column called biography. Whatever is there, we're going to import. And then for the format, we want that all the migrations use the basic HTML format. So again, we're going to use a plugin, name default value. Uh, this is the same thing that we use to define the default uh, content type. And then we say basic HTML. Uh, so by doing that, again, drosh CMI, drosh migrate revert, Drush migrate import, and then go to the website, refresh, and I have the content now. And as you can see, there is uh, you know bold text, links, and some uh, italics. So this is respecting the the basic HTML uh, uh, input filter that, that I have defined. One thing that puzzled me for a while and that I still have to check very often when I'm when working on migrations is, okay, this field has many things that I need to define, but how do I determine what are those things? Unfortunately, there is no a, uh, a straightforward solution to do that, but we can, uh, we can use some tools. The best way to do this is uh, for example, this value and this format, that is defined in the field definition. This is code, and we're not going to be showing PHP code today. Uh, but if you are a programmer and you want to know where this comes from, you go to the field definition and you look at the schema, like the database schema, and it will define these keys. So in this case, it, uh, it defines value and format. In an address field, for example, it is fine like address line one, address line two, state, city, country, and so on. So if you want to know where that comes from, unfortunately, you have to look at the code. And I, ha I was 
talking to Jesus Manuel Olivas, uh, the maintainer of Drupal console earlier, and he says that Drupal console doesn't provide a way to inspect this information from the field definition, but that pull requests are accepted. So if you're a programmer, you know, pull requests are welcome. But he came up with something that is not perfect, but kind of works. So I'm going to show what that is. I'm going to copy the field name, and this is a little bit advanced, but uh, for you to know. Just so you know, the field name you can get from the user interface. Yes. So you can actually, when creating a field, you can set the machine name, and if you go and edit a field later, you can read the machine name. Yes, so you should not change the machine name after making the field, even if it lets you. So the way that you figure out the field name is you go to content, uh, excuse me, structure, content types, your content type, and then edit fields. And this is the machine name. So I, I assume that this information I already know. So that's why I wasn't showing this before. But this is where it comes from. So in this case, it is field NBE biography. So if I go to the command line, I type drush SQL CLI, that CLI. This puts me in the database. So careful when you're here. This is just for demo and, and you know. And then, because I was scared of the command line, I, I, I went out of it. Uh, it is too dangerous to do anything in the command line, even for checking and stuff. So I, won't use, I will use Drupal console instead. <laughs> So Drupal console prov provides um, a command called database table debug. So this will give, me for will give me information about a table that I define. And then if this is, this, this is a node that I want to inspect, I use node, two underscores, and then the name of the field. And if I do that, it gives me the information about the table. Remember, this is what I wanted to learn about when I do SQL CLI, CLI but because it is too dangerous, I walk away quickly and use Drupal console instead. So Drupal consoles provide this information. What are we looking for? The last two. The things that start with your field name, underscore, something, that something are the ones that you can define in the migration later. So as you can see, I, I have value and format. And if I go to the, here, this is value and format. So it is not a straightforward, but as of today, this is like the non-programming way of finding which keys are available for you. Okay, that being said, uh, we're going to continue. I feel like I do have to say, you should be working in your local computer in a virtual machine where it's very hard to damage your site no matter what you do, on the command line or otherwise. Um, and also that from a lot of the fields that you're going to be dealing with, you'll have examples. Like, there's lots of body fields out there. Um, you know, all of the, the um, YAML files you'll look at. And Drupal uh, Migrate Plus has a lot of example code and, and YAML files in it um, will have those examples. But like Maurice was saying, the address module, you're migrating something into that, like that's got a crazy schema that there may not be examples for yet, so you'll have to inspect it like that. So let me show you something. Uh, we're not going to import the department that each uh, professor belongs to. And we're going to store this information in a vocabulary. In, so the department is going to become a taxonomy term. The vocabulary is called department. And the machine name of that is MBE department vocabulary. It is not very clear in the image. It's really small, but that's the name. And we're going to use it in a moment. And the other thing I'm not sure we were quite as clear as we should be is that Mauricio is building all of the structure first. He's creating the content type. He's creating the fields. None of this is being created by the migration. Um, if you're moving from Drupal 6 or Drupal 7, um, it does an upgrade that will actually migrate the configuration first, and then you can migrate the content. Um, but if you're you know, migrating from any other source, you are responsible for building the site first. There has to be an empty house to move the stuff into. Um, and so, you know, and that includes creating the, the vocabulary. 
Okay, so this is the line 23 for migrating the department information into the vocabulary. In the node, if I go to the node, I see that I have a field called department that is an entity reference and that entity reference is to a vocabulary. And it is configured that uses the department vocabulary and if the uh, entity doesn't exist, which means if the taxonomy term doesn't exist, create it. So, how do we do this? Uh, there is a plugin, and I'm, I won't be going to the documentation, but all of this is documented, called Entity Generate, which means if it doesn't exist, create it. If it already exists, look for the value and use that value. Then, the source, remember, the source is whatever is in the CSV file. So, in the, there is a column in the CSV called Department. Then, what is the entity that you want to generate? I, I want to generate taxonomy terms. What is the bundle? The bundle in the taxonomy term uh, entity refers to the vocabulary. So the machine name of the vocabulary is MBE department vocabulary. And this, uh, the value key and the bundle key just copy and paste when you want to do a uh, vocabulary migration. There are a, lo a lot of things that has to do with the database schema again, and we won't be going in depth. And uh, you know, most of the time, just copy and modify what is needed. And this is required for a taxonomy term migration. So um, Mauricio is risking the ire of migration purists and sort of ETL purists in that, um, and, and Mike Ryan was really risking their ire in adding the entity generate option. So you notice that Mauricio deleted each of those vocabulary terms, that, um, taxonomy terms, right before redoing this. He couldn't migrate, roll it back. So the very pure migration would be to do a separate migration of taxonomy terms and then you know, have that be referenced the same way you'd reference users to content or anything like that um, to do it. But it's usually a lot of overhead for a simple migration. Um, it's just it should work the same way it works when you're creating content on your own, which is it'll create the term if it needs it. And that's what Entity Generate will do. And okay. that's the approach being shown here. But just both approaches can be used, and if it's really important that rollback works completely, then you would want to have a separate um, migration instead of using Entity Generate. Entity Generate. Okay, this is a department, and if I refresh, I can see that the departments were added, and if, I, and if I go to the professor, I can see that they are already there too. Yep. What's, the, what's the risk if does the rollback just not roll back the taxonomy terms that are created? Yeah. Is that actually harmful because clearly nope. entity generate or entity create basically does a oh create if needed, right? Yep, exactly. So so for, if you're happy with them, it's yeah. there's no problem. Very like if for this example, like there's really no reason to have done a separate migration because yeah, it's like, I mean, so the worst case is like... If there's one you didn't need yeah. anymore. Well, yeah, exactly. So if you're importing 10,000 things and like you're cleaning up the yeah. the original source file, you know, that's an issue. But I mean, there's, you know, you can do programmatic ways. I mean, if you're using an approach where you're sort of, you're building it, you have all of the configuration of the site committed to version control and you're basically just site install fresh, and then running migrate, which is a completely valid workflow, um, that also can get rid of any unwanted artifacts. Yeah, uh, and of uh, course, so the other way, if you're having a bunch of related sites that might share the available taxonomy terms, then you can just do a migrate to an empty site and then actually put different professors and stuff in, you know, if you have two, three, four different sites type of thing, mm -hmm. that would help you with that. Okay. Yep. Now we're going to migrate uh, images. So for images, it is a little bit more complicated and we're going to demonstrate doing a migration of the file themselves and then connecting those files to the node. So we migrate the files first and then we make the relationship with the, with the, with the node. So this example is a little bit advanced. So if you have questions, just ask. And 
this is the full migration. And you will see that this contains a lot more information than this one. And the reason is, if I were to do a configuration export right now, Drupal will provide more keys than the one that I am defining. Like, remember that I started with the very basic stuff. But Drupal will provide more if I do a configuration export. So, uh, for example, the UUID, the language, language code, status, dependencies, class, field plugin method, CCK, like those things come from Drupal out of the box. Uh, it is good to have them, it's not bad, uh, but in, in, I wanted to show you know something very simple so it is easier to understand. And before explaining the, the file itself, how it operates, I'm going to show you the source file. So the source file is called MBE Photos CSV. So in, in this one, we have two columns. One column is the professor ID again, which is going to be used to connect with the node, and we have the photo URL. So when you are going to migrate files, you have many options. One option is to have the files locally and read from your local computer, and the other option is to have the file in a remote server. Let's imagine that you are doing a migration of your old D6 or D7 site to a D8, and you are you already have a staking server when you have done a lot of work. So you want in that staking server pull directly from the old site, so it, the new for, the information is there, and at some point switch switch the sites. Uh, this is more. Co so, like, I'm moving from an ASP site to a Drupal 8. Mm -hmm. So all the images are already stored on the server, like you just said. Yes. Okay. So now say that again about moving them. So, for example, if you have an ASP site with all the images and you have the relative URL to them, you can use that from migrate to, to pull the image directly from the web server. Instead of having to download the images to your local computer and reading from your local file system, you can read directly from the web server. So this is what we're going to do now. So, you know, usually when we have a website, we have relative URLs for everything inside the website, and we are assuming that this is also the case for the images. So these are the relative URLs of the images in the agaric.com website. And because the domain is the same always, uh, we're going to have that as a constant, like agaric.com is going to be a constant, and we are going to append this, which is the relative path. And then that will give me a full path, and that is what I'm going to pull from the server to copy to Drupal. And uh, let's see how it works. So again, like I will remove the things that make noise. The ID is required, and everything else is not. Uh, here, so I am fetching informa information from a CSV file. So I I have the CSV plugin again provided by Migrate Source CSV. The path, header count, and keys. In the source, I can define constants, which I'm, you know, I define a value and I can reuse that value later in the process plugins. So, the source base path is going to be my domain. Like all my my images are under HTTP colon slash slash and then the relative path. And when you uh, configure an image field, you define where in the Drupal site do you want to store these images. Uh, in this case, we are saying that we want to store in the public directory of Drupal under a folder called Professor Photo. So uh, this is going to be moved into Drupal, public folder, slash Professor Photo. And the destination, which we're going, uh, we're going to cover the process at last, is going to use a plugin of entity file. In the case of the node, it was entity node, because we are migrating files, it is now entity column file. Now, how do we do the migration itself? Uh, remember that the source file 
contains the relative path. And internally, we need to define a name for the image. We don't want to have the name of the image be sites, default files, pictures, you know, everything. We don't want the relative path to be the name of the image. We only want the last part, like picture two, the numbers, that JPG. So the way to do that is that we are going to define a variable. So in the process section, you can define a variable. Before, we were using things that are either provided by the content type, like the title, or by a field. But in addition to those, you can define any random string, and that is going to be a variable that will be available later. So I am defining a variable called destination file name. And I am going to, uh, when you apply transformations, you, you can apply one or multiple transformations. So in this case, I am as using a plugin that is called callb callback. The callback uh, plugin, what it's going to do is, it will call any PHP function uh, available in PHP, and it will process uh, whatever, you pass some parameters and you get some result. So in this case, the, the function in PHP is called base name. And when I call this function, it will transform the relative path to only the file name. It will, it will remove the directory hierarchy. And I want to do something else. Uh, and this is not strictly required, but for you to know, sometimes where you are migrating data, uh, like not all the information is available. Maybe not every professor has a, a, a picture already in, in the website. So what we're saying here is that after you return from uh, you know the callback of base name, check if if there is a value. If there is a value, continue. If not, skip the whole row. Like do not continue doing any of the processing below. So like if it were if one of the columns were empty, with this option we skip the whole thing. Maybe because it, without an image, it doesn't make sense to copy like copy an empty file that doesn't exist. So that's why we do this. But in some cases, like you can you can decide to skip the row the whole row, or only skip the column, which translate to leaving the field without a value. And if you will leave the field without a value, then Drupal might also pick up the default value that you define in the UI. So, and remember that this is a variable. The variable now contains the finding only. So, I need to define the destination inside Drupal where this file is going to be copied over. How, again, I define another variable, in this case, destination full path. I use the concat plugin, and what I am doing is, I am passing two things, and I'm going to put a slash in between them. And what are those two things? First is the const contents file directory, which is this. And then the destination file, which is the file name only. So when, a f when an image is going, to, is going to be copied over in Drupal, it will be like a public, directory in a subdirectory called professor photo and then the name of the image. And because images can contain, you know, ac ac characters with accents or for example, Cedilla and things like that, it is recommended to like transliterate that, which means you, you just use uh, alphabetical or numerical characters, then we do a URL encode. And that, you know, what that, whatever the result of this, we encode that, yes? Well, so that, that was what I was actually going to ask you. The, uh, <coughs> is there a module and stuff that you can use to do the transliteration and have rules for how you found or named and even the past, the, you know, the directory path that they go into? Are there ways to hook into that with this, or do you have to process that afterwards to move on? Uh, so the question is if, if you need to do more processing, probably transliterations, like if, that, if there are modules that help with that, so um, Migrate already provides a plugin called URL encode, which is used specifically for this case. But let's say that you have a URL, a path alias that you want to transliterate out of the box. You, if there is a PHP function 
that does that for you, you can use that. Uh, for example, you can use a replace, like a string replace, and do that manually, which would be error prone. So in the example today, we are working only with YAML files. But you can define, remember that when Drupal uh, provides more keys, there is a key that is called class. So you can define your own class, and in that class you can define your own methods. And then you do the, the transformation using that method, and from, the, from, the, from this YAML file, you call whatever you have in that class. So you, for, for that, you will have to do custom programming. And in general, for transliteration, there, are, there is a module actually called transliteration in Drupal 7, which was migrated to Drupal 8 core. Uh, but for the migration itself, uh, it, is, it is not like easily available. You would have to do something like this. So maybe there's another way I can ask. There are, there are rules set up for creating a node. So like when I upload a file or I put things in, they get processed when the node gets saved. Does any of that get triggered when you do it through this, or, or do you have to do that after that? So let's say that, so the question is, let's say that I have some hook, for example, that acts on node save, and that using that hook, I transliterate the, the path alias, for example. That will work. Uh, migrate triggers the, the hooks, but that's a good question, because sometimes it is not desired to trigger the hooks because it is a very expensive operation. Doing a node save and then triggering the hooks is a very expensive operation in terms of time and resources. So if you have, if you are migrating a hundred thousand nodes, it is going to take a lot of time. So the migrate API allows you to define what hooks do you want to skip, and then you can do that. And also, that's different from form validation, which most, which will not be. Yep. Correct. Yeah, for for validation won't be triggered by this. In fact, you can you know you can enter whatever and any invalid data using a migration and it will it will put the, the the information there. For example, if a field is set as required and you don't migrate that field in the migration, it doesn't matter. It will still save the node. So form validation uh, is not tied with the migration itself. So you need to be very careful and you know this is like an iterative process you try you, you you see the result you go back you modify until you get the result that you need yeah. and just I mean, Mauricio was, as Mauricio was saying you can define more methods like you can you know, you, you, know, you you can use your own class in your migration and then in that case you just want to take the migrate the class that was being used and just create your own and inherit from the old ones, so you, all you have to do is add one thing. But in the case of, of process plugins, um, you could just take the URL and code plugin um, and, um, and copy it, you know, and then make your changes and keep it available to everything. Um, you know, obviously not in core, you keep have that in your own module, but it's, it's pretty easy to support more process plugins. And that, with that, we have the destination where this is going to be stored in Drupal. And now, what is the source? Where, where are we copying, copying from? Again, we use concatenation. We get the constant uh, source base, base path, which is HTTP colon slash slash agarit.com. We put a slash. And then, again, the relative path that we have defined in the CSV file. And this is basically you know, the full path to the image on the web server. And when we have two, these two variables, then we have, this is expected by the file entity my, uh, destination. It expects to define an URI, and then you, you call the plugin file copy, and you pass the source path and the destination path. And by doing that, if I go to the terminal again, drosh migrate status, photo field, uh, migrate import, it says three elements were created. If I go to the site, uh, to content and files, I can see that the files are already there. Like if I were to revert that migration, these files would disappear. <laughs> but so far, I have only migrated the image itself. If I go to that 
to here, and I refresh, I will see that the photo is still not associated with the with the node. So now that I have the file in my in my Drupal installation, how do I you know associate it with a node? Let's see. And it is this code here. And again, I need to be very careful when pasting. So the, the, in the node, uh, in the content type for, for professors, the field is called field underscore MBE underscore photo. And then I define a target ID. That's how, how it's working. Uh, the files themselves are references to other entities. And you know, target ID is what we use to define what thing we are pointing to. So in this case, remember that we already did a previous migration for images. So what, what are we going to do? We're going to look through that migration for the one that corresponds to this specific node. So there is a plugin called Migration Lookup. I passed the name of the migration. This is the ID. If I go to MBE field photo, the ID, that's, that's the string that I paste there. And then, uh, I put that there, and then the source. The source, again, is uh, my CSV file. And remember that this is a separate CSV file. Uh, I use the key source, uh, excuse me, professor ID, which, you know, wherever you find professor ID in the CSV file for the photos, match that with the professor ID in the CSV with the biography and all the other fields. And, uh, it is recommended for many reasons that images have an alternative text. You can follow the approach of looking at the code and finding the field schema or what I show with Drupal console. But, you know, I, did, I already did the homework. The, the property is called ALT, which stands for alternative text. So the field name, and you can see here that uh, this is not well intended and it will break if I didn't fix that. It was like one indentation to the right. Uh, the field photo, alternative text, and then I define a default value for this. And the, the alternative text for all the images is going to be professor headshot. So if I do that, drosh CMI uh, to, to import a new information and then I revert uh, excuse me and migrate again, go to the website, refresh, and I have the photos now. So when you are when you are migrating images, files like a PDF or paragraph we, we won't be able to cover, this is how you do it. You have to do a migration for the file or for the paragraph, and then a separate uh, configuration in the main node migration. And one thing to note is that you can imagine that the migration from the node depends on the migration of the image field. So there is a way that we can uh, make that explicit. So we can add an extra key add a, to the CSV file, oops, sorry. And with this, we say uh, this migration will depend on on this other. Uh, if I were, if if this weren't in place, and I try to run the migration, it will try to work and fail if the previous migration has not been run. But with this, we are enforcing that the, the migration for the field image needs to be uh, run before this one. So, and if you have like for a paragraph migration, you can, you know, you can add as many dependencies as you need. And if you want to see the, you know, more keys, for example, you can also define module dependencies. For example, this migration requires the CSV plugin that is defined by the migrate source CSV. So you can, you can, in here, you can define dependencies, modules, and then you, like the list of modules that are required. And we are uh, almost you know, out of time, 
So one last thing that I want to share is that for, for a chance, the light demo didn't go as bad as, as it could have been. But also, uh, migrations are, are easy when you understand the pattern. But sometimes, you know, one space in the YAML file can, can break the whole thing. So this is Adam Glavus Goinch, Feno Proxima. He is a migrant maintainer, and about two weeks ago we were in, in Boston, and he, I was asking him some question about migrations, and we spent like an hour in something that was obviously correct, but didn't work. And he said, this is impossible to understand for people that are not migrant maintainers. Himself being a migrant maintainer, we spent over an hour to something that was obviously correct, and we didn't make made it work. So do not feel frustrated. Ask other people, look for examples, and you know, uh, get involved with your local community and try to help each other. So thank you very much for your time and for being here. I was wondering if you could briefly, if it's possible, uh, talk about how to handle multiple value fields. Uh, so that, it is time, feel free to leave if you want to, but the question is about migrating multiple value fields. Uh, it depends on the field. For example, if it is a taxonomy term, you just uh, pass a list, and there is a process plugin that, uh, for example, if you pass a string of comma-separated values, that process plugin is going to separate the elements by the comma and put them in, in a multi-value field. And the example that we didn't cover about my uh, about paragraph, it's you can use an iterator plugin, and the iterator plugin will go over a list and put like for every element of the list, like in element one, element two, element three of the of the field. But it, it will really depend on the field type that you're trying to migrate. Uh, you have that process plugin that separates a comma separated list or whatever, you, you pass whatever string you want to be your separator, it can be spaces. You have this iterator plugin and other ways. Uh, the recommendation is to check the, the process plugin documentation in Drupal.org. Um, in Drupal 7 migrate, um, when I was migrating from a really bad spaghetti code system I'd written. Um, one of the problems I had is I wanted to maintain um, full history of when things were created and stuff. So like I had users that have been on the system for like 10 years. Mm -hmm. And the you could migrate all of that stuff with the entity API just hard coded be set, uh, created to the current time. But the great this happening, is there any way to, and I had to just go in when I was running my migrate to comment out that line of code which I really uh, is there any, do you know that in Drupal 8, can you actually maintain uh, what users were created and other other entities? So, so the question... Update it if you have that available source. Yeah. So the, the question is if in Drupal 8 it is possible to, uh, to define when an element being a user or a node is created, and the answer is yes. Uh, in the migration, you, you, you know that you have title, and then you define the title that is defined by the entity. Uh, there is a, another key called created that you can pass a unique timestamp, and that will you know use that for the creation time. And the entity code doesn't, yes. it doesn't override it anymore. Oh, correct. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> and they fix that. And uh, yeah, there yeah. is actually a process plugin that. Uh, well, I don't. I lost it already. But there is a process plugin. Look for it that is used for format date. So maybe your source file is like April 1st, 2015, and you want to change that to a timestamp because Drupal okay. expects a timestamp. So using, the, it's called format date. The process plugin is called format date. You can use, you know, the, 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 you know, the elements to transform that to the timestamp. And you can even define, for example, the time zone using that yeah. plugin. Is that migrate extras? No, that's Drupal core. Yeah. And Migrate core. All those other things I can ask. Oh, and then I also assume it was implied from some stuff you run. If you modified, like in your CSV, if you modified one of the rows, that would get run as an update. If you added new rows to it, would it just insert the new ones if you rerun the same migration? So, 
because I noticed it was displaying number created, zero, you, uh, you always said zero updated, zero. See, so uh, you can modify the you can modify the source file, yeah. and if it is something new, it will work. If you are modifying something in particular, the uh, the keys things can go really bad. Yeah. What if you change, like for example, if you went and changed somebody's biography, would it just do an update on? Yeah, yeah. If, if okay, you so it's going to compare. So the migration knows what it, it'll compare what's in the CS in your source with what's in the database and determine that it's been modified. So, or do you so need another, do you need another row to indicate? Uh, oh no, so. So uh, I let let me see if I understand correctly. If you update that data that already exists, yeah. Okay, so when you revert, you lose everything, and no, when you no, import, no, no, Drupal six migrate. Uh, sorry, Drupal seven migrate would know that something had changed. Like if you just went into the CSV file and edited somebody's some text in the, the biography field, for example. Would it know enough to say, oh, okay, because I'm pretty sure Drupal 7 migrate, let me do that. Because that, otherwise, what's the updated, uh, when it tells you how many were created and updated, map. what kicks off the updated uh, values? So you have to tell it something to kick yeah. it off? You have to turn on, yeah. so it treats the migrate mapping. Yeah. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah. If you turn on to keep track of the migration so that you can it, yeah, yeah. The that, that's what it was. It kept track. It kept track of the keys, and then if you re-ran it, if you re the migration, it got you'll yeah. find the IDs that's already created, and then update the fields. Because yeah, I'm I just, thought it. it I, I I may be wrong because I I pretty much I haven't used that feature, but I thought you did have to tell it like like a timestamp or something. No, no. It, it's it's going to look at everything. It's by the primary everything. keys, and it's if the primary key exists, it, it always does an update based on the information. Wow. Yeah, and so because when you said that, you know, Drupal, you know, migrating Drupal to Drupal is much easier. My experience actually, and of course, migrating from six to seven is horrid, anyways. But I found out that doing non-Drupal to Drupal was easier. Because the migrate, I could take two or three months to get everything ready and continuously update as the source system is live. Whereas when I did a six to seven, I had to like document all of this stuff and then I had to shut the site down for a week and did nothing but ran all of this migration stuff for a week because I didn't have the capability to just continuously feed updates and changes. Yep. Um, interesting. Um. Yeah, um, again, for, for the way we're doing it, for moving from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8 yeah. for a very large um, site, is that we just, you know, you know migrate. You just undo it and redo it. Yeah, we just undo it, redo it, and like before going live, you know, we, you know, we, you know, the site's live and we've migrated, you know, up to that point. And then we just have to, you know, turn the site off for like, yeah, you know, the, the a minute, like just like no, nobody add any more content, yeah. and then we just import the last, you know, yeah, ten this notes. Yeah, where I meant the Drupal and, six yeah. or, seven upgrade process was in place with Drush, and it was absolutely horrible because mm -hmm. you had a crap load of field changes. You know, oh, yep. you, you had the old image field and, and all kinds of other yeah. messes like that, and it was like a week. It took a week actually. To and and for so. long running migrations, we actually have in the audience someone who is expert in that. And I think there is a session about that this week. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> if the person wants to raise his or her hand, <laughs> very welcome. Otherwise, look at the look at the schedule because there is a session about long running big migrations. So. Have a look at that. There is this no, weekend? Not the migration, it's, it's long recurrent imports. I'm not using migrate modules. We are covering more complex case when you can't, well, you possibly can run migrate if you were running like 10 migrations concatenated one to another. I'm covering more complex case when you have to use multiple sources, they have to be combined, processed, and that. They also have to uh, recur multiple yeah. times. Yeah. If you want to it is count. Okay. Sure, of course. So, but you know, for Drupal seven to Drupal eight or Drupal six to Drupal eight, you you know, it it does a migration of the configuration. Like you don't like, like 
you use that once. Yeah. Like it's okay, great, you help me out. And then you throw away all of those migrations and commit the configuration. Gotcha. And so you're not trying to like you're not trying to tweak migrations to get to con import configuration right. I don't import roles. Um, you know, like so you, you you basically use the upgrade path to get you everything started and then you do the kind of tweaking that Mauricio is showing, but you don't try to rerun all of the migrations that um, that are given to you by a Drupal to Drupal migration. You you use them all at once and then you throw away like it, you know you use them, you get all of this configuration, but then you get to tweak the configuration and you throw out the migration so it doesn't overwrite your configuration changes. Yeah, um, it's like the, and the, stuff the, like the roles Drupal too. 6 one, I think it actually did it in a database that was either your Drupal 6 database or a copy of it. It was, it was hard. Yeah, no, the way it, it was not using migrate. Um, no, no, yeah. it, was the, the, it yeah. was the Drush migrate. Yeah, it was, it was, it was, so, you know, the migrate module existed, um, but the way that Drupal went from one version to another yeah. was like this unbelievably complex self-update oh, yeah. and it left a disaster. Yeah. And there was no way to redo it programmatically. And, so that's, that's part of the reason why that version was way more pleasant yep. than any Drupal to Drupal yep. upgrade that you have before that. No, but now you get sort of the best of both worlds. You have like it, you know, the Drupal to Drupal gives you all of the migration boilerplate that you so you don't have to create it yourself. You just have to you can just tweak it, um, but you can rerun it exactly the same way you would for a non-Drupal to Drupal. When you said six to eight is supported better than seven to yeah. eight, what's your uh, just what are some highlights on why that statement is true? Um, it's it's just that was the community priority. Um, okay. Was like oh Drupal six is end of life. We need to focus on supporting that first. Um, so it just. It was just prioritize and get it first, but I mean, we're doing Drupal 7 to Drupal 8, and it's, it's, it's well, working, it's okay. well supported, yeah. Okay, good. And it's not like there's anything wrong with the Drupal 7 one, it's just that it was a overall community priority to do Drupal 6 first, and then do Drupal 7. Cool. Cool, thank you very much. Thank you.